And a lot of what we were about was volunteering. And that's the thing that I believe, even to this day, we volunteered continuously. That was friend of the show, Randy Burns. I'm Jeff, and this is Storied San Francisco. This is it. The very last episode of season three. Randy and his friend Jesus Barragan pick up where they left off in part one with the story of their meeting back in the mid-1970s. They talk about the gay and lesbian scene in San Francisco in those days, and they end this episode and the season with their messages of advice to younger LGBTQ folks today. Here are Randy and Jesus. I never dyed my hair, and I had long black hair. And one of the things, uh, Jeffrey, about our membership, it was very diverse, tribally speaking. So there was no one tribe that dominated, like the community boards were made up all Sioux, all Navajo. They had a Navajo club. They had a Sioux club back in the 50s and 60s. We were not, we, we were not that tribalistic, and so we were intertribally mixed, meaning there were many people representing different tribal backgrounds. And so, so well, we had few po- uh, Pomo people peeking their head in and out. Usually at Pride Parade, you would see them because they were uh, from r- res- uh, rancherias from up north. Um, but they never really actually joined us until they moved here. And then, you know, so, so but then you had a lot of uh, people out of towners and that uh, when we had teepees, and uh, we had a, uh, after, uh, I don't know what year it was when the people of color, queer activists, stormed the stage at Pride and took over the Pride uh, Parade uh, event. What year was that? Was it in the 80s? Mm. And then after that takeover on the stage in front of City Hall, it became, the board, Pride board became more diverse, which meant people of color used to uh, be in the front of the pride parades. And I, we I were never the pushed way in the back. Uh, it was in the 84, 83. Barbara Cameron was part of it. Pat Normal was part of it. And uh, in the Chronicle today, San Francisco Chronicle, late Ken Jones died. Um, there was a big write-up on him. I don't know if you knew him, Jesus. No, I but didn't one know of him. Things You didn't know him? Well, one of the things I kind of noticed that uh, happened back then, we were really into organizing. And, you know, I met other people when we went to the very first march in Washington. I did see other cities like Gala that exist in L.A., like you said, New York and Houston. Mm -hmm. You know, Houston, of all places, they had a big contingent of loud mouth activists. I mean, they were loud <laughs> and at the march in Washington. And uh, so you got a chance to see beyond the Bay. We got a chance to see it nationally when people of color started really organizing in all the big cities. Randy, since you bring up other cities, um, I was going to ask you both because you both have talked a little bit about the challenges that you as individuals and and your groups faced with racism, with homophobia. Um, But I'm, I'm curious to know your thoughts on the fact that you were in San Francisco and San Francisco, I I don't want to downplay those problems back then. They're, they're still with us, unfortunately, but, you know, despite that, or in the face of those, that homophobia and that racism. Do you do you think that um, the more accepting kind of culture here was was emerging, and and that you know may, maybe what you did here you weren't you wouldn't have been able to do maybe just anywhere, maybe Houston. But <laughs> what do you what do you oh, think about that? That's true. Yeah. Well, you know, when we did our flyers, we posted at the Indian Center, and one of our community center uh, community member went to the old Indian Center on Balenciaga de Bose. You remember that old American Indian Center, Jesus? Yeah, when Chucky and, uh, was there. So the, 
Yes, that generation of uh, when when before she came at chief executive officer, mm-hmm. and then they took away community board elections, so we could no longer vote. So that we were kind of locked out at that point. But one of the secretaries, the front desk person, said, "By posting your outreach flyer, are you thinking about people you might offend?" And and I said, I uh, someone pointed out, it is a community board, community announcement bulletin board. And they had, we brought always when we did outreach, we always made sure we had tape and tacks, and a staple gun. So she she looked at us like. Okay, let me ask for. I said no. Many of our members live in. I mean, work here in your programs. All the artists are uh, working with American Indian Workshop. How dare you? Uh, they got sassy, so she agreed to put it up. So you know, they were minor things, mm-hmm. but with our membership, like Jesus said, when you had your very first meeting, sir, right in San Francisco on 6th Street, sir was a, a community-based uh, organization, mainly serving the South of Market crowd, and so um, we never met there. We met in our apartments, and then when we did get a grant, we got a, a chance to um, pay rent. We had an office space. And a lot of what we were about was volunteering. And that's the thing that I believe, even to this day, we volunteered continuously. Mm-hmm. Even uh, in organizing, when you became a member, you filled out a membership application. And I'll tell you the reason behind that. We didn't think about it, but it came in handy later. But we had membership applications that were all approved by the board, president, and the secretary, the full board. So we, be, we like I said, in the 80s, we became more structured, less party, party, party. And our meetings would go from six, seven o'clock until maybe one, two in the morning. Wow. And it were very productive meetings. And near uh, clo- uh, near the end of the meeting, someone said, "I'm thirsty. Let's go buy some beer and we <laughs> finish our meeting." Having a half case or a case of beer back then, beer was cheap. And uh, so, though, so, and then after the meetings, I said, "Let's let's let's shut the meeting down. I want to go go to Espinosa. I want to go down to Aunt Charlie's. Blah blah blah, mm-hmm. Tenderloin. I want to go to dance. Blah 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 blah. You know. So those were the good days uh, of of organizing serious queer native people. To me. Uh, and they had a, they were very generous. Uh, the drag queens we had, the three, they were hairdressers, and there were other hairdressers that followed. But they always left a big tip for our uh, hat or our fundraiser because that was that was their tip they earned at work all week. So you know, twenty, fifty dollars, you know, and that was nothing to them because you know back then. Uh, you know, hairdressing was a big thing. And uh, so today, like Jesus said, that the queer community is its all about privilege and the color of your skin even today. So racism is subtle, like homophobia in our Indian programs and in our general Native community. It's subtle. Mm-hmm. But yeah. when you organize community-based organizations like when I bring people together for a townhouse social, is the whole issue of that it's clean and sober. That changed because of the AIDS epidemic in the 90s. So the clean and sober thingy, where our board meetings were clean and sober, our everything changed. Our community events were all clean and sober. No more partying. And so it was a new beginning and then, of course, the epidemic came along and took many of our members away mm-hmm. in the 80s and late 80s. And our first case of AIDS happened in 1985. I knew Roderico Reyes. I knew him. Before. I didn't know he was an actor. And there were a lot of things beyond gay American Indians, beyond Gala, locally speaking. Many of us had our own skills. He was into theater. I didn't know that until later. 
Uh, they were, you know, people were poets and writers. So we had our own entertainment we could pull from within our membership. And uh, the drag queens came dime a dozen. <laughs> and um, yeah. First, let me say two things. Uh, that for a lot of Latinos, we, we get our color because of uh, uh, Native American blood, like me. I'm, I'm part Apache and Yaqui. And I'm sure that if I wanted to qualify, that I could because I, I'm more than what is it, one eighth? Yeah. Uh, I can Okay. And, uh, and also, the other thing I wanted to say see, I, I don't really like being referred to as a person of color. Okay. Because when you look at Latinos, we go from uh, the, the lightest of the lightest to the darkest of the darkest. And uh, uh, because we have, so basically they're transplanted Europeans right. over here in the Americas. Mm -hmm. Like you look at Argentina, uh, uh, you look at uh, Uruguay, Paraguay, which has uh, the lowest percentage of intermarriage with the indigenous people. So we so so you can have a blue-eyed blonde Latina from who knows where. So how do you say that person is not a person of color? Right. I mean, so uh, to me, the term doesn't work. And I I tell people uh, a person of color that if if they're gonna kind of insist, then I'm lavender. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know that's the thing. I have we always we notice in the queer Indian queer community at large was the issue of tokenism. Yeah, the light skinned person usually were appointed as aides to city hall or to the democratic yeah. clubs, and they uh, they were always boyfriends of the president of that democratic club or at city hall mm -hmm. they had contact yeah. so they always had lighter skin people and when we were organizing game wreck indians our membership were totally brown we were all full mm -hmm. blood and then of course when we went underground in 96 uh, the bay area american indian two spirit come along and for the most part, they're they're a very light skinned, very uh, college educated, and they are not into volunteering like we did back then. Mm -hmm. They are very standoffish. They kind of act like in in I they, not all, but good majority of them act like white people. It's a class thing. The values, yeah, it's, class class thing. Thing. it's fake. It's plastic and it's fake. And I personally, I'm not into, um, you know, I'm not into a clique of yeah. college educated wannabes. I call them wannabes because they know nothing about their culture, nothing about their language, know nothing about their history, but their two spirit. And that's all the term they know. Yeah. You go you know. ask them. Who are you? Where are you from? What tribe are you? Oh, I just call my two spirit. I'm happy with that. And then they change the subject. Boring. Yeah, see, it, see, so, so many variables. Like, I remember we had a member from Nicaragua. And in, over there, he was white. Over here, we would try to tell him he wasn't white. And he couldn't understand it. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, yeah, we had a lot of uh, in our, our internal stuff, you know, uh, we did preserve the culture. Uh, uh, when you look at what's out there today, we actually, we planted the seed for that. We, uh, two of our members, uh, because in the beginning there was nowhere to go. Uh, we, we went around, uh, Rodrigo and I went around asking places uh, to, hey, what, uh, you know, make it into a Latino bar. You'll make a fortune. You'll have no competition. There's no, nobody wanted to touch the idea until two of our members opened up Esta Noche in hmm. the late 70s. Okay. Yep. And, uh, and, and, and they, saw, they saw the crowd that they would attract 
by had by the dances we 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 used to uh, put on, mm-hmm. we used to pack that place. And, uh, and when we had our events there, same thing. You know, we had benefits there at that bar. And and, and Harvey Milk did come. Uh, Harvey Milk did come uh, to uh, a dance or two, but when he was running for supervisor, uh, when he made it, he actually wanted to meet with us because he asked for our endorsement. Mm. And I I can't remember what he said, but one of our members called him out on it and said and told him, well, Harvey, isn't that a a rather racist thing to say? And again, I can't remember what it was. And Harvey uh, responded, well, you guys will just have to show me how to be a good racist. And I told him the only good racist is a dead one. And (laughs) it it haunts me to this day. (laughs) Oh, no. (laughs) Yeah. Wow. Remember the the movie uh, Milk? Yeah. The director, he visited David Campos at City Hall, the supervisor I started volunteering for. Mm-hmm. And uh, uh, and he was the director of that movie, and I told him about that. And uh, he, oh, we don't, we don't, uh, 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 David just went, oh, you know. <laughs> <laughs> they decided to leave that out of the movie then, so, Jesus. Anyway, I just thought I'd share that with you. Yeah, that's a good one. Hey, guys, uh, we've yeah. got a lot of good stuff here. Um, I do maybe want to end with you, you've both spoken to sort of what you think of the the generations after you, the younger folks um, out there right now. I'm curious, what would you each say to those generations? My, the old folks, my parents, uh, when, before I started going to school at University of Nevada, Reno, summer school, then their extension to UNR, and then, then come a to the bay, they always said, my mom always said, because she came out here in the 1940s, part of the early BIA, Bureau of Indian Affairs, in 1940s, and so she saw San Francisco. She was a trained dietitian. She retired as such. God bless her soul. But one of the things I, she constantly said, I've seen the other world. I've seen the white world. And I also know who we are as Numa people, Indian people. She always said, and and uh, Grandpa always told me, "Good luck, my grandson. You know, always go forward, but never forget who you are." And I think one of the things I carry on today is like what you, you and I don't. We didn't think back then. We were we were planting the seed. And the seed today that when people are saying you're the grandpa of the contemporary two-spirit community, I don't see it as that. It's just something we had to do to survive back then. And now we're here. And to the younger generation, I say move beyond the term two-spirit. Find out who you are. Mm -hmm. And actually, when you say, I've been wanting to call you, you don't have an email, you don't do text, well, you're not on Facebook, I don't know how to reach you. Over and over, I gave numbers out to these, I say, wannabes. Mm -hmm. And they never, you never hear from them after, say, a Bates powwow, which Mm -hmm. is coming up here in February. It's not from the heart. Mm -hmm. And when we had people uh, in in both organizations, when you had hard-ass people that really, truly believed in the spirit of the people, it wasn't about me, me, me. It was about our people, Native people, and about our indigenous roots. That include the language, culture, and history. Mm-hmm. So I, I just say to the young people, you got a lot of learning to do, read learning. So that's all I would like to say. Thank you, Randy. Hey, Suze. Yeah. Uh, the message to the younger generations, and uh, it's not so much the uh, generation uh, after me, but uh, the youth of today that, okay. San Francisco, it's like, uh, and then the Bay Area, 
it's but particularly San Francisco, it's like a, a planet all by itself out there. And, uh, and then the Bay Area is also like that. So what that means is that no matter what we what freedoms and liberties, uh, whatever we enjoy here, don't take it for granted. You must always protect it because you can lose it. We just had a, a very important presidential election. And if we ever came close to losing democracy in this country, that was it. Mm -hmm. So see, so the lesson learned is you, you're going to have to fight for it, continue to fight to, to, to protect what you have, because yes, you can lose it. Uh, and that uh, that goes from from rent control to to uh, affordable housing, uh, the the freedoms that uh, uh, gays and lesbians enjoy in this city. Uh, you know what exists here does not exist like in uh, Ukiah, mm -hmm. okay, or Bakersfield. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, we have to protect it, and. Uh, you know, like Randy says, uh, there's a lot to learn. Uh, uh, we have, uh, I feel I have a lot of work to do. Uh, it's going to take years and years and years of uh, hard work to undo the damage that Trump and his administration did. Mm -hmm. So we have a lot of work to do, but we, we, we have to keep in there. I mean, uh, I mean, People marching in, in 2020 for, against voter suppression, what is that? Right. You know, so no, we keep fighting and don't take it for granted. Thank you, Jesus. This is the last episode of our season three. And um, I think uh, I definitely love and respect you both for who you are and your participation in what we're doing. but. I think having you together um, is just a super special thing that I'm, I feel very blessed uh, to be part of. So I wanted to thank you both. Mm -hmm. What is that song? It was very popular, ta da 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 together. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, right. I could, uh, let's see, I'm still learning how to Lulu. La, 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 la. I can't Lulu like the women do at powwows. They hear them real loud. La, 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 la. I haven't getting there, but not that there yet. Um, but uh, you know, I I just want to say it's 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 a journey that never ends. And what we have, like Sue said, we have queer past and present. We can lose it and the future and the future. Yes. If we're not careful, mm -hmm. and careful meaning on all levels, look at our environment, look at pollution, look at all the con contamination a man has created, mm -hmm. including wealthy, privileged individuals. Mm -hmm. I'm not jealous of that, mm -hmm. you know, and, you yeah. know, but I'm going to work until I pass out mm -hmm. as we I met it. remember with who? <laughs> when yeah. i pass out at a party <laughs> yeah see see it's very simple you the lesson learned is you must you absolutely must live in harmony Thank with you. nature because your survival depends on it that was randy burns and jesus baragon Michelle and I are taking February off from producing and putting out new podcasts, but that doesn't mean that we'll disappear. Please continue following us on social media and look for podcasts to resume in March. Music for Storied San Francisco is by Otis McDonald. Photography is by Michelle Kilfeather. The show is hosted and produced by me. Michelle and I have produced more than 140 episodes over the last three years. And you can find them all at our website, storiedsf.com. While you're there, please check out our store, where in the month of December, we're donating proceeds of all sales to Supply Hope Info, 
a new nonprofit helping students with distance learning. We're on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook, where you can like, comment, and share the stuff we put out. Find our shows just about everywhere you can listen to podcasts, including most recently BFF.fm's new podcast network. Please subscribe to stay up to date on all the content we publish. We love feedback, so if you have any, our email is storiedsf at gmail.com. Thanks for listening. Stay strong, stay safe, wear a mask, and stay healthy. This podcast is a proud member of the BFF.FM podcast network. Learn more at podcasts.bff.fm. BFF.fm, best frequencies forever.